Hello and welcome. We are coming to you from the sidelines of the JP Morgan India conference and we're going to talk about payments. It's an exciting subject, lots of interest here in India, uh, new business models all around. Uh, I have with me uh, Takis Georgiakopoulos. He's the global head of payments. He's also the member of the operating committee at JP Morgan. Takis, great to have you with us here. It's a pleasure. Thanks great very much. Great to meet you. Uh, tell us, what's been the experience of the conference so far? You're meeting investors, you're meeting companies, I assume. Uh, what do they want to know? What are the kind of questions you're getting? What's the feedback? We are seeing investors. We are seeing a lot of the local tech companies. We are seeing a lot also of the US and European multinationals that do business here. And, and for me, it's my first visit in India post COVID. And what I see is really a sea change in investor sentiment about India. It's extremely positive. It's extremely bullish then there is a whole kind of ecosystem of technology and innovation that I see for the first time in the country. Someone made, gave me the stat, I don't know if it's true, I heard it in the room. In 2019, you had maybe a thousand startups. Today, you have a hundred thousand startups. I don't know if it's true, but again, it's a, it's a sign of how much more, uh, how many more interesting things are happening here. So it's, it's great to be here. Mm. Uh, where is India in the payments ecosystem, in the evolution of payments vis-a-vis -vis other countries? Are we far ahead? Are we right up there? I mean, that's essentially what we believe, but <laughs> you tell us. Yeah, you are. And as I said, from coming here from 2019, it's like it's a big change, right? Yeah. So UPI before was, you know, a little bit of a theory. Now it's real and it's everywhere, including in, you know, the stands, people buying stuff for five rupees. So it is here. It works really, really well. Uh, I've seen, we've seen the digital adoption being really strong. And, and what I, I really like and I find very thoughtful is how you guys started from creating the first layer, which is digital identity, then building payments on top of that, and then building credit on top of that. So I think the way you've done it is quite interesting. It's quite unique. Um, it is government built, but with a lot of private sector support. And from what I've seen in the last couple of days, it also supports a lot of tech and fintech innovation on yeah. top of it. So I think it's, it's a very unique model. Maybe Brazil is pretty close, but you guys are, are up there. I mean, digital public infrastructure, starting with Aadhaar, UPI, I mean, and now, of course, there is ONDC, uh, which is, of course, coming up. But uh, why isn't this being, is this being replicated in other parts of the world, as you see it, when you've got a bird's eye view? Yeah, the, the problem with payments is it's, it's very, very local, right? So I, I would say the country closest to India is probably China, both in terms of size and the moves towards digitization. It's just in China, it happened with private companies, right? It was WeChat and Alibaba that started it. And then the ECNY, the CBDC from China, came in to provide a public network as a resilience and an alternative to that. In India, you actually started with the public infrastructure and then the private innovation on top of that. Mm. If you go to the developed markets, we have digital currencies, like, you know, no one walks around with cash in, in Europe or the US, but you don't have the same uh, innovation around digital identity and digital payments, nor do you have the same cost structure mm -hmm. as the one that you are creating here. And the cost structure is what uh, is very interesting, but it's also, uh, I don't know, a bit of a pain point for companies trying to make money off payments here in India. So, uh, I mean, tell us, I mean, is payments on, on the B2C side, which you and I kind of use every day with uh, UPI and uh, you know, private companies and their services built on the layer of UPI. Is it, is it going to be profitable by itself or you think, you know, companies essentially will have to do other things? Yeah, so fortunately, my business, Jeff Morgan Payments, we are in the wholesale business. So we do a lot of B2B payments. We move $10 trillion every day across 120 currencies and 160 countries. So there is always a little bit of margin to be made when you move money in complicated ways, big volumes, etc. When you come in a retail context, like in India, and then payments are free, that, by the way, is not the free is probably rare and kind of unique to India. But everywhere you see the, the payment for core infrastructure continues to go down, which increases the barriers to entry, increases the necessary efficiencies. That's why we all invest in the cloud and AI and ML and all of those things to reduce our cost base. But when it is free, you need to think of new revenue streams and new ways to add value to your client. So my view is if you want to survive in the payment space, you need to move upstream. You need to think about software as a service, data as a service, UI, UX. How do you add value to your clients? How do you add biometrics, better security, better customer experience? 
better integration to the kinds of ways in which they use their payments and be able to charge for that value, not wait to add for the uh, to charge for the payment rails because that seems to be at zero. Zero. <laughs> I mean, thankfully for, for the consumer. <laughs> thankfully for the consumer, thankfully for the merchant, not so much for whoever provides the infrastructure. Do you think, uh, uh, you know, lending is the most profitable, kind of most visible pie of the entire piece as well. A lot of payment companies in India do lending on the site, not off their own books, but tying up with banks and uh, sort of, you know, uh, lending to yeah. their uh, consumers, customers, small ticket size loans. Do you think that is the way to go? I mean, uh, broadly, uh, not going into any specific company and what they're doing, but at a general industry level. So if you look at lending in general, right, and around the world, I'm not talking about India specific. It is a good way to make money, but through the cycle, it's a very dangerous way to make money. Mm -hmm. And for many companies, what they've seen is when you go through the cycle, we've seen that with buy now, pay later. We've seen that with consumer lending. It's also a great way to lose a lot of money when the cycle turns. So in order to do underwrite, in order to make money on credit through the cycle and do it efficiently, you need to be able to underwrite smartly. You need to be able to choose the right customers. And then you need to be able to have a lot of the data and information to train your models to do it smartly. So I think what you will see, especially as we go through in a full economic cycle, is some companies do it well, many companies not really. So yes, you can make money, but longer term, you need to be really smart in it. Uh, tell us about the experience of uh, publicly listed payment companies in the US, for example, and what they have, what's happened to them was that we the valuations are they're able to come on because we're also in a high interest rate environment at this point in time. Uh, how is that settling and what is the learning for companies here in India? So I, I think one of the biggest thing is like, you know, gravity exists everywhere and at all times, right? So during the world of zero interest rates, mm -hmm. discounting future cash flows meant much higher value today. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same company, but at interest rates of five or 6% is going to be worth half as much. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the valuation adjustment is simply adjusting for interest rates. Mm. But I think the other half was about unrealistic expectations. Mm. Even if you are in the payments industry, the software industry, at the end of the day, the competition is high mm. and your ability to maintain your growth and your margins becomes harder and harder. Mm. So I think what we've seen is some adjustment because of uh, interest rates mm. and some adjustment because of more rational growth expectations. And from what I saw in India, again, I see an explosion of, you know, tech innovation, which means some companies are going to be successful and are going to be amazing. But overall, you would expect also valuations to come down to earth for most of them. Well, but the space remains as vibrant as ever, right? It is. And the innovation is there. The investments are there. And I think in India, you are at an earlier stage of that innovation because the digital infrastructure is here. The country is growing quite uh, rapidly. Mm. And you have this you know, incredible potential of a country with more than a billion people, very young population, and a tremendous growth and uh, an upside in front of it. Well, it's lovely speaking with you, uh, Takis. Thank you so you much too. for joining us. Very nice to meet you. Thank you Great for having me. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.